Um, I'm David Wessel, and uh, I'm one of the directors of the uh, Center for New Music and Audio Technologies, which we're going to hear about today. From Adrian's <laughs> going to give most of the talk. I might chime in from time to time. Adrian Fried is our research director over there, and um, has been with us since the very beginning in <coughs> late 80s. And um, I'm not going to spend much time introducing him, but I would like to say that uh, you're going to hear more from us uh, as time goes on. Uh, we'll have other speakers coming from CINMAT and so on, and I've given a talk here in a previous uh, session, so let's go. Adrian Free. <laughs> Thank you, David, and good afternoon. So I'm going to give a brief overview of um, CINMAT and what we do. Some of you have already heard CENMAT talks where we've done more extensive things, but I thought I'd get everyone on the same page. Um, then I'm going to talk about a couple of applications we've been involved with uh, and what they might tell you about systems design questions in swarm systems. So CENMAT is activity uh, all over the place, but especially in this building at 7050 Arch Street, um, just north of the campus. We do a lot of concerts there, once or twice on average a week, I'd say, there was a concert. There's some excellent talks going on next week, for example, in research area. So if you're curious about what I'm talking about, you can get on our mailing list. Um, this over-the-top <laughs> flow diagram uh, is supposed to help <laughs> us think through all the interactions with academia, industry, government, the public. But the most important thing to capture off this is that we have an unusually tight integration between the three activities. Uh, we don't teach from textbooks because we teach what we're actively inventing. And what we invent, it goes straight into musical production. And that informs what we should be inventing. So we have a very tight loop. We require our projects to have a, a musical outcome and feed into the educational components. So let's look at those three components very quickly. We do a lot of performances. We have a small 30, 40 person venue, but being part of the music department, we can scale up to five, 600 seats at, um, in Hertz Hall and to thousands of seats in Zellerbach. And we've done even larger venues. Um, we do a lot of research, the results of which are typically free software. Um, there's lots of downloadable software on the website. Um, but we also build physical things, uh, musical instruments. This is David's prize-winning uh, moment with his interface called the Slabs, which I think he's talked about already, but we can certainly cover again. Um, lots to say about the Slabs. Uh, very high data rate, very controlled latency to make it something you would want to um, perform with your entire career. Uh, here's something I'm in the middle of developing. Um, uh, we're actually redoing this. This is a uh, cello. Um, instead of bowing strings, you're bowing those uh, copper rods there. And these are uh, a specialized kind of multi-touch sensor with a sufficient resolution to capture what uh, cellos do. <laughs> and we make a lot of different kinds of instruments. This kind of covers everything from fabric uh, various fabric touch controllers where you can get pressure easily. Um, these things with lots of blinky eye candy that people like in instruments. Um, and uh, augmented instruments, taking an existing instrument and adding some sensors to it. And of course, uh, the XP in the middle of that. Uh, we'd love all this stuff to be wireless so people can uh, move around the stage when they're performing. Um, something, some things we've done, we've been around for a while, we've got some traction with a couple of technologies. Open sound control is probably the, the most common one. If you search for apps with, which do OSC, uh, we're up into the um, nearly 100 on the um, um, usual handheld platforms. Um, one of the key things that's relevant to Swarm about our OSC work is that it's highly motivated by the problem of managing latency and keeping the jitter down so that musicians can perform effectively with it. This is a patch showing some uh, clever jitter attenuation schemes um, that my colleague Andy Schmieder developed. The Cal 65. 
94 and the 96 allows you to split the beams so that you can have a bottom beam covering the main audience seating and the top beam covering the balcony. So this gives you great flexibility all inside one package. Cal has both low frequency and high frequency drivers and each one of those drivers is individually amplified and processed. So we worked with the Center for New Music and Technologies at the UC Berkeley to learn and model various different types of beam forming. One of the prototypes was a icosahedron and the research that we did with them allowed us to determine where we got into grading lobes, what was our maximum frequencies, how tightly we had it to pack the drivers and the types of processing that we would need to use. And this technology that we developed is based on the research that we did with Synmat. So at Meyer Sound, we've developed our own transducer production facilities. We have our own digital hardware and software development. Cal's our first loudspeaker to have AVB inputs. We can actually get audio signals across an Ethernet network using the new AVB standards as promoted by the Avenue Alliance. What this means is that over a single cable you've got the control of the loudspeaker, you've got the RMS monitoring of the loudspeaker status, and you can deliver your audio feeds. This means just one Ethernet cable is all you need to connect to Cal besides power, and you get all three things over one single cable. So this makes it really easy to integrate with your IT infrastructure, with your audio infrastructure, and with your... Just a quick comment about that. Am I on? Am I on? Yes. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the Memorial Stadium, there are, in fact, uh, 41 such columns around the edges of the stadium. And so they've just installed that for the, for the new stadium, and it's, it's working pretty well. And so it allows the uh, sound to be directed over the heads of the audience uh, right down to the uh, field itself. Yeah, and it keeps the sound away from the neighbors because it's a controlled beam. And um, it goes right to the edge of the field, but it doesn't swamp the field with sound and, unless you want it to. These are all steerable beams, too. Um, so um, we also do teaching. Uh, I want to point out a class I'm a, a little bit involved in the development of that's going on right now, which is really exciting. It's a very long history from the bone flute to auto-tune of music technology, and it's been very interesting to contextualize what we do over that time interval. But of course we have, uh, and these classes, they're listed as music classes, but they're cross-listed all over the place. Um, and gra we have grad students from all over, all disciplines participating, uh, not just music students. So I'm going to talk about telematic music as an uh, application space and do this little case study with you. Um, uh, telematic kinds of things are going on all over the place. We've got, you know, uh, telesurgery. So this is this problem where you've got, um, you know, the expert surgeon in one place and the person that needs the surgery in some other place. Um, we've done it. Uh, also on this campus with um, uh, Lisa Wymore uh, with dance, where uh, dancers in several places around the world are dancing with uh, projected avatars of each other. Um, so it's the, what I'm going to talk about. You can think it through if you like for 3D reconstructed virtual objects uh, in visual areas as well. I'm going to focus on the sound application we did. The key thing about these applications is their live performance with audiences, and we can't afford to have them fail. So these security reliability issues end-to-end -end are really important. And there's one interesting way in which those requirements, are, the satisfaction is established, and it's what I'm, I'm just using right now, this term situational awareness. The, the participants have to be um, aware. So if you're performing in one place, you have to be aware of the performers you're with um, very solidly, even though they're not physically present. And, that can, uh, and the audience has to be able to read the presence of people who are somewhere else. So let's, let's just look at an example of this. Um, it was performed last year. Here we go. The two locations are Berkeley, Wheeler Hall, and San Diego. 
Barely starting, here we go. So the trombonists in, and the bass player are in San Diego. And Myra Melford, music department, jazz performer, is playing piano wheel of horn. And there's an audience looking at these live musicians in each location. And we're projecting video to give a sense of what the other musicians are doing, even though they're not in the same space. And we're compositing four views, and the size and the position in space is automatically being determined by the salience of the activity. So I'm going to run for a few minutes just for you to get a sense of what it was like. The trombonist has just finished a solo, so they appear large in the screen, and it, you'll see the size is shifting now as the piano is coming up in the mix. The bass player is playing now. More, there's more action more relevance. We can certainly hear it in the audio mix. We'll see when, you'll see now the bass player's got a large view in the composited video. Trombone is hanging out. Piano's got smaller. So we've got a finite resource the size of the screen and we're managing it according to the, the real-time evaluation of Trombone is kicking in now, so now we have to grow up with that view. Now they were playing free at the beginning, but now they're really getting into a groove. We've got better than 10 milliseconds delay for the audio, so they really can play together. Um, what we've done is prioritize the audio and using relatively low frame rates and relying on the fact we've got lots of information to composite on the screen. But it's definitely the kind of question you want to think through. You can hear completely, they're able to play completely intimately, synchronously, or asynchronously. With it. Yes, between the audio feeds in each direction, between San, San Diego and Berkeley. And of course the important thing is it's a constant 10 milliseconds. No, the network delays it. <laughs> and we and we and we do the jitter attenuation to establish an upper bound you know, a bound on that. So yeah, lots of questions about what's going on here. Good. Oh, so do you try to keep it stable at ten milliseconds and not let it go too low? Because it seems like if it's waffling around that Yeah, That's the key. No jitter. Low or no jitter, yeah. In the case of radio orchestra, it will be a conductor's position to end the drummer's kind of, uh, not, not usual, it's a 20 second kind of constant delay between conductors and end play of the radio orchestra. Yeah, so the conductors have this fun game of having to cue people earlier or later in order to get the wave front <coughs> from where they're standing to synchronize. It also means that no player in the orchestra is hearing a mix that makes complete musical sense. Uh, Remember that the sound travels at 1,100 feet per second, so roughly a foot a millisecond. Um, all right, so... So we, if you have uh, two similar instruments that would have to be playing in some kind of sync but in different places, then would you notice the problem, like that two pianos that were having to, to sync up with each other? 
yes, people can certainly hear uh, that kind of delay structure down to a millisecond. So this requires a development of a new technique, certainly, to play. And what's interesting is that there are performers, in fact, David's done this, who are playing the other side of the world with much longer latencies. And, and then you really have to, uh, as a performer, uh, rehearse in different ways and use different musical strategies. Um, but this, I, I, like concerts between Berkeley and Budapest, or Berkeley and, and Hamburg. And uh, so what we did was we actually tried to get the delay to be part of the rhythmic structure. There we were in uh, over hundreds of milliseconds of delay. So. Yeah, but I, I... We just built it into what we were doing. I, I think I want to just say about all this is that it's gone from an esoteric <laughs> occasional thing for the fun of it to something that's being completely built in to a lot of working musicians and performers' way of doing things. And so they're embracing these issues and calling, obviously, on our system engineers and to... To, to provide what we can. We can. I want to just yeah, quick. Let me say something too. That the pianist here, Myra Melford, and the bassist have a, have a trio together, and there's another percussionist involved. They regularly rehearse over the internet before time. Because they, and then they travel to get together. And it's really important, like that bass player, you know, you can't travel anymore with a bass, it, it won't let you on the airplane. You know, you have to put it in the baggage. And of course, that's a very big, uh, a very big deal. So many musicians are relying on this, particularly for rehearsing. Uh, it's very common practice. So the purpose of this slightly bewildering slide is to make sure that I won't go through every combination of space and device, but I want to mention a couple that you might not have thought through unless you're really involved in this kind of production. Obviously, the performer has microphone. But we hang microphones in the space, well, partly so the performer can hear the applause, but also because we're recording the events for later. Um, also, there's often a control room or a control area where all the mixing and so on is going on. They may have microphones and headphones to direct sound to the camera operators or the lighting operators in big production and so on. So there's microphones so, uh, involved in all these kinds of spaces at both or more different locations around the world when we're doing these things. Um, it's rare, actually, to have cameras on the control room folk. Um, uh, but certainly the performers and the space. Um, loudspeakers are for the performer, the audience, control room. Um, when you have loudspeakers specially set up for the performer or even um, in-ear monitoring, um, those all have their own special mix of sound that the performer requests and shapes. Um, and of course, someone's got to be responsible for the paying public. Um, uh, and the control room um, has lots of different sound uh, sources, actually. You have to be able to switch in and out of intercom with the camera operator. And the performers and the audiences are both at, at all the locations. Um, same issue with the display. It's often necessary to provide the performers with cues in their own private displays as well as the large displays. So you have a large number of sources and sinks of different kinds with customized information with salience decided by the people involved. So the usual solution is to fully provision as much reserved dedicated bandwidth in the system as you can. Um, and that results in things. This is, you know, Skywalker Ranch. I, I watch the mixing of uh, um, some of the Star Wars movies there. And it wasn't unusual to have five or six people in a row behind this console, all taking care of uh, hundreds of channels of audio, all going to get mixed down into two or 5.1. Um, and the way, you, if you want to describe this technically, you know, sort of outside the audio engineering way of describing it, you basically put a person at every constrained bandwidth node to filter the traffic according to salience. So when you're mixing um, to a CD or um, two channels, you, your source material is hundreds. Some, something, something, some choices have to be made. And so far, most of those choices are made by people. In the video situation, it's this kind of insane TV production thing where there's maybe from 10 to 30 people, rows and rows of, uh, uh, with responsibilities distributed in a kind of hierarchy where 
this is what's actually being broadcast and someone has sort of the final authority what's being broadcast but all this material is is condensed and uh, Pete, someone here might have the responsibility of tell, telling the cameraman to keep an eye on something um, and then there are directors and sub-directors in that. So let's look at why I'm using this word salience. Um, the, the dictionary definitions use the term in a rather static way, um, talking about state or quality of things standing out with respect to its neighbors. I'd like to suggest it's dynamic and also goal dependent. And so a better place to look for kind of definitions of that is from people studying human attention and um, let's just take a couple of simple cases. A security camera basically wants to start recording or alerting someone monitoring it when there's movement in the space. This is kind of a bottom-up, memory-free and reactive, very simple kind of measurement of activity or salience triggers it. But if you're trying to cross the road, um, you actually have to move your head, move your eyes, change your focus dynamically, looking for moving objects uh, and other hazards some and one of the interesting thing is there's a certain amount of creativity about that uh, I almost got run over by a bicycle in the dark the other day and so we kind of have to increase the number of objects we're expecting to see so salience is from my point of view is dynamic um, and this is basically the problem of moving through life you've got the only a limited amount of attention you can focus on a small number of things at once so you have to prioritize these bottom up and top down um, source of information. So the telematic strategy we used in that video um, you saw was to allocate the bandwidth and latency budget according to salience signals. So for us, auditory, these are music concerts, so the sound's a priority. We only have, doing the technical work on this particular project, two guys, one in Berkeley, one in San Diego, and they have to do everything that the musicians aren't doing. <laughs> so we decided they would, their main job was to get the audio right at both ends. And that's enough of a puzzle because they're controlling the sends to the other location of audio, they're controlling the sends to the auditorium they're listening to, and they have to make sure the musician is comfortable hearing what the other musicians are doing. So they're already trying to do three things at once. So what we did is fully automate what the, um, was happening with the video. And we threw cameras at the problem, overhead cameras, large cameras, um, and uh, wrote some software that tracks salience and um, dynamically changes, does the kind of thing that a, um, a beginning director would do trying to deal with video streams at both ends. And one of the keys, tricky things is to figure out um, a kind of neutral background, whatever that might mean in the medium, on which you can do this composite, compositing that makes sense. For example, the challenge is if they're lit differently, the musicians are lit differently in San Diego or Berkeley, to actually composite something that looks like you've made an ensemble is a little bit tricky. So there are strategies, you know, neutral backgrounds um, um, towards that goal. So, and I mentioned, I gave you a hint as to why we had to do it this way. It's a scalability <laughs> issue that you're going to encounter. In fact, in a sense, I suppose that's a key part of the terror swarm. When you scale up to very large, you have this thing where the sensors and the computation are getting cheaper, but people are getting more expensive. Not because we're getting greedier or because of economic things. It's this basic fact that people are, on average, in the wrong place. And it's expensive to move people, but it's much cheaper to throw around some silicon that sits around than it is to fly people around. So we can't get the expertise where we need it on average. It's obviously big events, you can pull together your power team and make it work, but uh, most of the time we'd like to do these things. In fact, for those rehearsals, um, there is nobody helping. Those rehearsals that David mentioned, the musicians get together, they want to just push the equivalent of their Skype <laughs> A group call and have all this stuff put into place, the cameras and so on. So we've got to integrate these salience engines into the system. Um, yeah, I brought this slide in to kind of emphasize what was going on, but I think you've got it. Um, you can see the changing sizes, so we'll just move on. So. What are the systems requirements at a lower level to support this? The key thing for me is 
We've got a lot of standards for representing sound, image, and graphics that are based on the delivery model where you deliver a canned object, a CD, a DVD, or something that's kind of hard-boiled and done. And we need more plasticity. We need to be able to actually dynamically modulate the resolution, spatial temporal resolutions, according to the salience um, thing. So uh, fortunately, we've got a really wonderful thesis done here uh, 10 years ago by Amar Chowdhury, and she was part of EECS, looking at the sound aspect. And he actually developed a strategy, which we'll see a little uh, slide of later, for um, um, uh, deciding what are the most spectrally significant uh, components so you can cull out the ones, uh, if there's not enough computation or bandwidth, you can cull out the ones that are the least perceptually um, relevant. And you have strategies pretty mature in image. We have these strategies called region of interest where you can tell cameras which pixels we, you want read out. Um, in graphics, there's a long tradition of, um, and boy, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but back face culling, um, looking at, you know, from a distance, you can represent spheres quite well with uh, very small numbers of um, triangles. And what you do is you actually look at the relationship between the viewer and the model, and you project back the resolution that's going to be available to the viewer, and then you simplify the models before you run the rendering pipeline. Um, I like to think of that level of detail. Not, it has a very specific technical meaning in graphics, but it's a, way, a good way of thinking about asking what the final uh, relevant thing is that the audience wants and projecting back and asking all the way down through the chain, what can you do to minimize bandwidth? Uh, gesture is an interesting one because people are now getting out of using uniform uh, sampling methods to the non-uniform and compressed sensor, which is much more natural because gesture doesn't occupy large swaths of bandwidth um, the way um, some of these other um, media are, are conceived. So here's a quick example from um, Amar's uh, PhD talk. So he's got a sound synthesizer over here that's being pinged to generate a block of sample, vector of samples that are going out the output buffer. And when the computation resources um, run out, so we're going to detect these quality of service failures, um, I, and I'm just going to kick this thing around a few times, and you'll see the audio buffer building up. When we're starting to not satisfy our target latency, there's feedback to tell the synthesizer to start using less com computational crunch. That's his PhD thesis. You can look at... And he measured the perceptual salience to make sure that this kind of dynamic strategy didn't interfere too much with perception. And this is the way it operates. If you look at these spectral representatives, time and amplitude uh, this way and frequency that way, you have these regions of less significance perceptually that you can smoothly drop out. Um, and so... Um, this, un this was fun to discover that John Lazaro and John Warshnick worked on this problem and this, this um, terminology, um, address event representations. Instead of, they were interested in, uh, I guess in chip design, reducing the number of wires to move data around. Um, so what you do is you've got this data from various places, you send it over a single channel, and time is represented um, uh, implicitly by when you send the data, and location is represented by an explicit address. Um, in the case of, you know, uh, isochronously sampled systems, all this stuff's implicit. You kind of know uh, and regenerate clocks for this, but this is a sort of hybrid. Now, MIDI, OSC are already address event representations, um, and... Uh, um, uh, this is sort of the hardware level. At a higher level, this is still a useful thing to do. Send things when they're salient and label them so you know when and where they happened. Um, and this is a, kind of a thought experiment to suggest some of the challenges with this approach. Because I've kind of assumed that salience, or suggested some kinds of salience are easy to compute. Actually, it's a little tricky. So if you think about the close-up or the long shot, the advantage of a close-up is most of the pixels available have action, relevant, interesting stuff, unless the action moves somewhere else in the scene. 
and then your camera's pointing to the wrong thing. So that's why in filmmaking, the long shot is often referred to as a safety shot, and you try and have that around to move to. Just think through the long shot right now, two musicians or two boxers and come sports action. The more you zoom out, if you use difference-based encoding schemes, um, most of the pixels are the same when you zoom out. And so you actually have lower data rates, but of course, less detail. So just by controlling the zoom on a camera, you actually have a continuous modulation of these sorts of salience bandwidth trade-offs. Um, and that suggests and in, in a way motivates some of the research we've been doing. This is our, uh, the spherical speaker array you saw that motivates some of the Cal array work, which is a linear array. Um, also here is a microphone array, which has an array of cameras in it too, uh, which give you a full 360 um, a spherical uh, visual view as well as a sound. Here's our own microphone array. Um, we're using this uh, to track something really difficult, which is the sonic displays of hummingbirds. Um, we're just setting those experiments up now. And so we've got lots of hummingbirds making these displays at once. They make a really interesting two kilohertz signal from their tail feathers when they um, uh, spread them. But we know very little about it because it's been too hard to measure. We'll know where they are, which hummingbird, because we can um, uh, steer these virtual uh, microphones that are built up on there. Um, and we've been building mechatronics into the cameras and the microphones uh, for that reason I mentioned, to automate the um, salience. Here's an example of a, so there's our beam forming. Uh, we can point as many beams as we want to John here. And there's a ring of infrared proximity sensors around us. And we've done this perverse mapping where this makes a sonic object that gets quieter when you get close to it and louder when you move away. Uh, and also it tracks it so other people in the room won't hear what he's hearing. And it can make as many beams as we want and we can track as many people. Currently we've, st we've shifted this to sticking connects up in the ceiling to get more of a top view to track people around the room. This is the kind of... Um, tool that gives you more control over salience and compositing in a 3D space. Here I think are some of the research challenges. How do you infer the saliency requirements from user actions in a very dynamic context? Yeah? So how, how many people, so assuming you figured out the tracking part, which I understand is complicated, there are many people, but how many people could you direct individual conversations to? Uh, it's, uh, as many as you want. So there's no inherent limitation in the, in the, the device. Of the number of speakers have something to do with how many? Yeah, we have enough there that um, the beam is narrow enough that you would have to be kind of physically squished up next to somebody to really get the same experience, sonic experience. Yeah. Um. So keep in mind, there is some spillage. Well, presumably the spillage would be reduced with more speakers or something. If you had even more resolution, you could, could you very, very narrow the beam? Well, it that depends on the frequency. In high frequency region, the beams can be quite narrow, and lower frequencies are much more. Yes, you're right. It, the speaker count is a factor. Uh, and we've built the biggest one in terms of speaker count, and we've, it's fairly good. Um, that, that speaker has 100. Um, here's a funny thing about that is that it all it follows the regular fil digital filter Gibbs phenomena. So we have um, the narrower the beam, the more you spill out the back. So we can actually make a really sharp narrow beam if we're willing to throw away with some absorbers behind the speaker, which is a quite a common situation. We park it at the back of the room, so we can actually get really narrow beams. Um, so, uh, so and the, and the real challenge is. How do you have the system learn what a mixing engineer learns by doing a rehearsal, what they call a sound check? They learn what, uh, they get a preview into what's about to happen and that allows the anticipatory systems, the, the long shots and the close-ups. You, you get a sense of where, where the musicians are gonna be, where the dancers are gonna be on stage because you've rehearsed it. 
but where are our ways of doing that? Now, if I think about mo people carrying mobiles walking into spaces they've never been to before, there's a lot of situations where there is no rehearsal. You, go, you show up to a train station you've never been to, and you still want to interact effectively. So that, I think, is going to be a big challenge in this warm arena. So how are we for time? Yeah, this is a shorter, this is actually a switch of gears. So any more questions about that? I'm basically putting a big pointer to salience and suggesting that we need to dynamically know something about what people are trying to do in a more sophisticated way than Google, which tracks keywords flying around in your life, in your email or whatever, and then throws a, a guess as to what you ought to be buying next. Um, that's fine, and it's of the same character as this, but we're talking about sort of the 10 millisecond, you know, get me the... Temporal resolution, get me the spatial data so I can, you know, fly a vehicle. Those kinds of real-time uh, constraints are much, much harder um, and much more interesting, actually, when we have a swarm-like environment. All right, so I'm now going to move to another issue, which I think is a really strong mediator um, of how we'll go about building swarm systems, and that's what I'm calling vernacular engineering. So... This is a little bit of a weird term, but I'm actually trying to get around a funny thing going on right now, a kind of a, a chasm being um, built between professional engineers and what professional engineers often call DIY or hackers. Or, um, and so one way of thinking about that is that is, is it's a vernacular issue. So engineers, members of the IEEE, ACM, um, are trained and develop a kind of literary language, a kind of official agreed upon way of doing things. And then there are a bunch of people that don't do that but still build things anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, they have an everyday language they make up uh, from bits and pieces of the official language and uh, what you might call street language. So. One way to figure out whether how this is going on is called a shibboleth. It's a word that, a, or a custom, or an action, even a sound, that a person unfamiliar with its significance may not pronounce or perform correctly relative to those who are familiar with it. It's used to identify foreigners or those who do not belong to a particular class or group of people. So I'm, I'm asking you to look for those in your own field. And so the classic one is this uh, tomato. Tomato, right? So, uh, and the interesting thing to note is who is the foreigner and who is the norm. Normative depends where we are. Like if one of you was in England, a conversation would be different, right? Um, so here's the shibboleth for the factorials. I'm going to ask you to write factorial. I could, we could do this in language of your choice. I chose C in this case. So some of you might go that way. Some of you might go this way. And um, they both mean the same thing in some way. But um, I can learn a lot from your background. This sort of declarative, iterated way of doing it, and this recursive way, this is more kind of the lisp end of things. This is more the traditional declarative language way of doing things. Um, and there's an old, tired dialogue about these things, which is, oh, this is so annoying because you have to invent these variables we don't really need. Um, and then the, these folks say, oh, look at this elegant, it's recursive. We don't have to invent those things. And then these guys say, oh, no, that's, this is um, way more efficient, right? Because you've got the stack and all these resources being used by a stack. You don't even know how many resources are going to be used. Here I know exactly how many. And then Scheme comes along and says, oh, this is tail recursion. We can optimize that out. Well, now you're both wrong because the fastest way to do this is in JavaScript or something where it's just in time compiled. You don't want it pre-compiled anyway because you want it adapted to the situation. So these are um, a hint that there are lots of, we have lots of dialects we're sometimes not even aware, aware of. Um, my favorite one to be looking at right now is Arduino. And the root, just to give you a quick hint as to the reason I think it's interesting, is that I think that the bulk of the leaf node software and hardware development in large-scale swarm systems are going to be developed by people who aren't professional engineers. The internet was like that. The internet of things is like that. Um, there just aren't enough experts. So here's one I noticed real early on. They have a, in the Arduino software world, they have this incredibly large file which defines all uh, a binary-looking text representation for all the integers. And what they didn't know is it was already in C. 
So it's already there. They didn't need to have that include file. To their credit, when I pointed it out, they said, oh, okay, we'll just shift to this. But they had to keep this in for, for historical reasons. Um, you see it in sort of silly minor ways, but they're just hints. You know, we've been calling things motherboards and daughterboards for a long time, but they call them Arduinos and shields. And actually physically, in some bizarre way, the shield sitting on top, the board sitting on top shields the bottom from, I don't know what they were shielding it from, but you know. Um, and they don't call that what they're doing, what they're making programs, they call them sketches. And so it goes on. They, they actually call Arduino a language, and it isn't. It's C and C++. Um, Here's a really frightening file for those of you who are professional software engineers. This is the file where um, the Arduino community undoes everything that's in the standard C and C++ libraries and does it their way. So they, first of all, in case someone had the audacity to define ABS already, they get rid of it. And they define it in this way, which is a famously wrong way. This was discovered very early on in C. I don't know if you notice, the danger of all these macros is that if, you, if the A and B you pass in there is a function or something with a side effect, that uh, these appear twice or more times, I guess, potentially. So the classic one that every Arduino developer learns the hard way is they, they, um, they might do um, A to D conversions and pass them in directly. So if you put... You, if you want to square the value of an A to D conversion, so you call the A to D function. And so what it does is two different conversions, one after the other, and multiplies them, which is very different from squaring one of them. Um, uh, other things that are weird, you know, I worked quite hard when I was an undergraduate trying to reach Richie and uh, sending them physical mail and try to understand. They had this word called read only, which I was desperately trying to use for what. Uh, and that dialogue ended up, with a lot of people, with the const keyword, which solves a lot of issues with these pound-defined macro substitutions. So this is kind of the modern way of doing that, that got ignored. You don't do this anymore either, because there's no way to deal with all the different kinds of floating points, half floats, big floats, and so on. It's, there's much more elegant ways of doing this, but that's what it is. Let's look at the Arduino IDE. They discourage binary modules. Um, they synthesize function prototypes because they're basically all that, all that software engineering work where we discovered we needed prototypes added to the C language. They undo them. Um, um, there's no debugger integrated and there's no assembler code output, no way to change the assembler flags. However, it's multi-platform and it's free. So at first, you might be tempted to say, well, can't those professionals just ignore these amateurs, DIYers, or what the people who start, the anthropologists and sociologists study this call them bricoleur, because there's a long tradi tradition of studying this kind of phenomena in, in France. Anyway, and we just do real engineering, right? Well, you can't. There aren't enough professional expert engineers, and there won't be. Um, my entire life, I've, in different parts of the world, I've seen attempts and estimations of the number of engineers needed, and we're just never delivering anywhere near enough. Um, and even when you are an expert engineer, you can't learn more than one or two domains of application during your engineering training. And we're going to have thousands and thousands. Just look at the number of apps for a, or a very limited device, actually, in terms of interactivity and connectivity. Um, what is it? Millions of apps or whatever. Um, so here's a suggestion. Vernacular engineers are engineers. In fact, we all started out being vernacular engineers. It just, we just have different people we agree with <laughs> about what to call what we do, right? Um, most of this engineering will be done with relatively untrained um, who won't be following best practices because we, none of us will know how to recognize a best practice. Um, and um, here's an interesting clue, which is annoying, but it's important to know. It's not just that they're unfamiliar or don't have time or the training to understand our conventional ways of doing things. They actively resist them. And because it's fertile and useful, because their application domains demand it. So they typically don't want to hear about operating systems. Why? Because they want to be able to reason simply about when computations happen. And um, 
there are some nice, wonderful, sophisticated operating systems, but very few of them run on small, cheap microcontrollers, uh, and they're not easy to understand how to use for the most part. Um, the reason they don't want binaries or assembler code is they're trying to force everyone into open source. And there are lots of reasons for this, but one of them is that if something breaks, you can find out you have at least um, some transparency all the way down to the, um, what every bit is doing and every line of code of the tool that's, that's actually doing the compilation. Um, and they earned a lot of efficiencies by rejecting the C or C++ libraries, which were invented and built in a situation with very large, relatively large memory and other footprints. And the other thing which the Raspberry Pi, for those of you who track these things, demonstrates, is there's way more speculative and risk taking in this community than actually in academic or industrial. Uh, nobody knows what the Raspberry Pi is good for, the designers, uh, the applications it's been made for. So you've got seven-year-olds working with their parents to build supercomputer clusters out of Raspberry Pi. Uh, we don't know yet why that's relevant or exactly what they're doing, but by making it $30 and getting it in through the schools and it, so it becomes, you know, let's go to a movie, let's go to a concert, no, let's get a Raspberry Pi. When it's at that level, uh, a lot more interesting applications that we can't conceive of, because um, there's, you know, majority rules. There's more people hacking um, than we could ever be in a professional context. Yeah. So about a month ago, I got a piece of junk mail from somebody who was clearly sending it to me. And what they said was, we've got to worry. There are these things like Raspberry Pi out there that are going to destroy uh, all of the security uh, we have now on websites because they'll allow factor, uh, factoring big numbers. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, these are in the hands of the common man and we got to stop this before it's too late. <laughs> well. Needless to say, I sort of ignored that email, but it was sort of kind of a very bizarre thing. It's like, here, this is, you know, a supercomputer for the masses. This is going to destroy everything. you got to do something. And you were expected to solve it. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I was going to take care of this. Well, yes, somebody has to. So how do we make swarm systems robust against leaf nodes developed by vernacular engineers? You know, my 12-year-old got bored with GarageBand, so I said, just download this thing for free called Max MSP and run through the tutorial. So I left him alone, come back a few days later, and he's changed my computer so that this horrible, loud, interesting, noisy sound comes out at full blast, tracked to my mouse when I'm using it. So this is, uh, uh, this is an indicator, and I liked it, right? So that, that's the problem, is I like this. So uh, this kind of creative use um, is going to be important to people. And you, we can't scale this thing that Apple and Google are doing of blessing apps that go on cell phones. How is that going to be scalable? It's already driving developers nuts at the current scale. But um, you, 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 how, I mean, maybe they can automate some tools. But as we know, there are always nefarious ways around them. So we have to actually design this in somehow. Um, and the other question is, how can we engage productively with vernacular engineers? And there's a couple of ways I've done it at Senmat. And one is I teach to the public in the summers. And we basically co-develop and co-learn with people from all over the place. So the front row here is your usual, why do we do this when we do these big workshops? We put all the teachers at the front. Um, it's kind of embarrassing when I think about it. And so the students are at the back. But just to make it clear, um, you've got award-winning filmmakers. You've got um, uh, previous you know, PhD students, uh, people teaching class in music technology now in Australia. You've got a real mixture. Um, that's Tom Duff, inventor of um, alpha channels and all kinds of other important things. He's now an expert at, because this class was on e-textiles, at building things uh, out of you know, string and fabric and all the other things I like to do. And he, after this, got a million dollars to spend at Pixar on building the Wally, the real life Wally, and got into robotics and all the rest of it. So just because you're not an expert in one domain, you can still be an engineer, but you're still, this, this vernacular thing is, it's a sort of a thing we always have. So by kind of mixing in people who are very skilled in one area with domain experts and, and really practically living together for uh, a week uh, making things, there's a kind of very interesting interaction that you don't get in um, a chalk and talk lecture um, um, towards a, you know, an engineering degree 
Uh, Hannah Penner Wilson there is now the leading e world's leading e-textile uh, designer, and she basically flies around the world giving workshops everywhere. Um, and she, she, her original background is in design and, and arts, but she's now a very solid engineer in all kinds of areas. So, and these are areas, these people are experts in areas that we don't even teach, to my knowledge, in ECS or mechanical engineering. We don't teach people how to design textiles for the purpose of interactivity. So, in a sense, this group will lead what will become codified in future official languages. Uh, this project is in the Sacramento airport. It was a student, a couple of students that took this class, actually the year after this class. And so they're very experienced sculptors. This is a huge thing. Uh, but they built the sound engine, the software in it. Uh, the only thing I had to help them with is people kept hacking in. Basically, as you type and browse the web, it sonifies based on the keystrokes. And of course, uh, the kiosk has been broken into in many times. But the key thing is, they, this project wouldn't have been possible budget-wise and conceptually if those artists had had to hire professional engineers. It was much more efficient for them to learn the engineering in this class, cobble it together, invite me and a few other people to sort of fix up some loose ends. And there's a lot of this going on, a lot more um, going on like that. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Yes. This is great. I really, I, I, I really applaud this kind of looking at the vernacular, like you're mm -hmm. saying. So I was actually thinking even, so the amateur, which I think has these multiple definitions. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. we talk about it as, um, you know, maybe someone that doesn't have particular sophistication with the technology, but it has this other meaning from like ammo, Amari, like to love. So people yes. love things. So I think in some sense we're all amateurs. And that's mm -hmm. like coming to that terms is like the first step of kind of. Well, we do love what we do. I think we, the kind of amateur astronomer, really those were early people that loved to just fascination with the cosmos. So I think there's more in common we have than we probably kind of admit to forthcoming about just it's a love for what the passion is that they're trying to create things. Yeah, I think that's the... Um, Sorry, it's not much of a question, but sort of responding to what you're talking about. Yeah, and I, that, I mean, I'm trying to keep shifting the words away from their previous meanings. That's why... I, I kind of like this vernacular. This vernacular science, there's a book on that. So this has already been kind of thought through. Because um, as, as you mentioned, a lot of important ast astronomy happens from amateurs. Um, and there's a great book, When Old Technologies Were New, um, which looks at the emergence of electrical engineering. It's essentially the history of how electrical engineers formed. Electrical engineers were pretty much the last of the en you know, engineering guilds to form. Um, and what's fascinating there is you just see this situation where people, everyone was clearly an amateur. There were no barriers of entry because there wasn't yet an organization. And nobody knows what to call anything. Like there's big debates about what to call electrocution, uh, what, which word to use for that. And there were big debates about whether the group should endorse it or not. And, and so you realize. There was a time for all these institutional things when everything was vernacular, everything was clearly for the love of it um, and unambiguous because nobody knew what money, what, how to organize around it. Um, and uh, the, I guess my insight is that we're, this is always, is when you look at the networking issue, this is always going to be the case. It's very slow and expensive to institutionalize uh, and agree on a vocabulary for things. So, on average, most of the time, we're in this dynamic flux of people speaking slang and dialects. Um, and we don't really recognize that if, we're in a, if we stay in the academic community. Yeah. Well, just maybe a, maybe a kind of response. I mean, here we are, we're sitting in a situation where you know, many of the musicians who use our stuff or, or, or use this program in the ground haven't had any programming experience at all. They don't look like software engineers at all. Well, I mean, I think if you look at the practice, a lot of programs, they don't look like programs. <laughs> and so we're, we're noticing that people really don't like to test. Things. And so we're trying to get this, you know, agile-like development strategy there, this push towards a, you know, behavior-driven design practice. And then uh, a development practice that depends on testing, test-driven. 
So that's kind of a missionary thing. We're out trying to get that into the vernacular. Although, but, but it's important to see how, how the resistance happens because there's no debugging environment in Arduino and that's because what they favor instead is collecting and uh, a big, something that is crowdsourceable, which is collecting and judging high quality f uh, fragments and pull, on pull down menus you kind of plug in someone else's mature code and cobble things together from mature pieces rather than bottom up invention and, and uh, you know, I can relate to that and, and, and the, for that a key pe piece of that is that it's not a binary library you load it's source code so you can actually learn something from that process um, and we kind of went away from that these big class libraries and big APIs they're unlearnable in the sense when I went to school we just studied two programs and that bulk of my thing we studied the Unix operating system and the C compiler um, the same way a music student would study orchestral scores. Um, and there's some actually terrible practice in that, uh, now I think about it. But large scale systems, real code, not hidden APIs. And so they, they have some, there's something important there to learn about too. Yeah. So it seems like distinguishing sort of folks who are unskilled at maybe what we consider pro best programming practices but have some domain expertise and they would love to do something from people who want to develop an own, their own environment and refuse to you know, learn anything from anyone. It seems like that's, those are not necessarily the same people. Yeah, although the ones that are really isolated, they tend to not get any traction. They don't build, a community doesn't build around them. So we see a lot of orphaned, you see this if you look at GitHub, um, what, with Git and GitHub, they've made it so easy to fork things. Um, you just get a lot of very personal, individual little things that happen and that they don't have traction. And the flow back up is an extra kind of energy you have to make and the community has to improve the reabsorption. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, I play music for my own amusement to learn around, about sound and what I'm capable of. I don't play music. I have been called on to do it on the stage, but that's not my choice. That's not how music operates for me and, and performing operates for me. And there's nothing wrong with that solipsistic thing, but, but it is different. Um, but there, but there's, this, um, there's a passage, actually, from the solipsistic thing, because I was an amateur. I loved different tunings. And all of a sudden, people start writing papers linking to things I've blogged about tunings and then a year or two goes by and I'm now the expert on guitar tunings and wait a minute, what happened here? So there's something about the way the web draws people into discourse that can actually transform you from dealing with your own problems into dealing with larger problems. So, yeah. if, um, so a second, second sort of either comment or question. So you sort of implied when you started talking about the vernacular issue here that how are we in the swarm going to deal with these Community, or at least you said something like that. Yeah. And so it seems like I would say that's an interface issue, in, in the sense that you know why is uh, why is the web as prevalent as it is? Well, there was a fairly standardized API that ended up being well adopted, and people could either deal with it in a sophisticated fashion or a non-sophisticated fashion, but it sort of allowed everybody to collaborate in one entity. And it seems like in the swarm. Uh, for many reasons, security, performance, all of these things, there will be a set of APIs that will arise for becoming part of the swarm, which is mm -hmm. somehow the bigger whole, as opposed to your, you know, people that stay isolated and don't interact. And those are gonna, by nature, have to be standardized in some way, and folks who want to interact with that will at least have to learn how to deal with those protocols. Now, they could program their own systems in whatever funny ways they want, but there is going to be a protocol they're going to have to interact with in order to be part of the larger whole. Yeah, but if, you, the, if the web's any sign of it, remember all those broken web pages that didn't conform. In fact, they probably still don't. Most browsers have to have a lot of latitude as to what they deal with. It's, and a lot of those decisions, I mean, I remember the email one, they were, the original UUCP was designed by, a, I think it was a 17-year-old cobbled together, and it suddenly, uh, uh, became big um, and so we have to engineer a certain kind of tolerance for things not conforming 
Uh, I mean, I don't know any. I don't I know any computer language designer who who would ha have a lot positive to say about cascading style sheets. I mean, I th as far as I can tell, it's impossible. Maybe someone's done a kind of a correctness proof or something, or to validate. You know, is there an unambiguous way to interpret a web page? <laughs> No, and there are lots of standards, and there are lots of very smart people involved in those standards, but we just have to accept, I think, yeah, I, I just don't want, you know, I've seen some of the writings, not just about Swarm, but in general, there's a kind of assumption that we can control these end-to-end -end things by just standardizing well. I don't know, it just doesn't, I just don't see that in our history of technology, recent history. It looks very ragged, and, it, and consensus comes too late, about the right way comes too late, it just continuously. I mean, AVB is a somewhat clean design the IEEE is doing of how to do media control and latency management, but there are, I think, from my last count, about 15 uh, interesting proprietary ways of doing Ethernet sound and so on, that some of which were well engineered, some weren't. And, uh, and those aren't going to go away with AVB. We have to co we have to coexist. Um, so, yeah. Other questions? So, just to push back on that a tiny bit, I, to some extent, just because I feel like being a devil's advocate, to some extent, if you're far enough off from the protocols that are in common use, your thing just doesn't work. And so, broken websites, you you could say that that's a failure of our standardization, or you could say, well, that person did not sufficiently adhere to the protocols out there in order to use, you know, be part of a common web browser framework. Yeah, but, but corporations are individuals, and Microsoft is one of the most spectacularly successful companies at breaking sure. consensus and imposing their own thing. And, you know, uh, I bragged about how many apps and, app and APIs there are for open sound control. But we made an early decision not to do any conformance, and there are no conforming OSC implementations, and so majority rules. So right now, I can easily make packets that some of the touch OSC applications can't deal with correctly. And so we have to do a lot of you know, hard work inter interacting with them, uh, the community, and it, it really is a majority rules kind of, you know, I just can't outdo or, we have the most beautiful thing called Osquino out there, uh, that's a correct full implementation of OSC for the Arduino, but there are already two libraries, one written by Bjorn Hartman a long time ago as a quick, it was written as a minor thing just to demonstrate a proof of concept, and it's sort of got dragged along into the API, and it's not something anyone wants, but to change it is really hard, so. Isn't there something similar going on with the privacy versus security argument right now? Because it's Mm -hmm. There's a lot of proliferation of this open way of doing to keep the privacy. Yeah. Is that similar idea that in some sense it kept keeping it open? Yeah. Um, it does, the logic is very similar um, in the sense that it acknowledges that the community who owns the question of whether, whether it's secure, it's, it's the same community of people who are, who are breaking it and who are making it and who value it. Right. So rather than make a narrow group of people who have the right way and keep it secret, um, it's hard to hold that small group accountable the same way you can hold a large group who, who really value and need the system. So that, yeah, I'm um, not an expert on the anthropology of that, but I'm sure it's been, people are looking at that. Um. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for coming. Right.